Hello? Dan? Mike? I'm in the back, Jake. Don't come in here. No! Don't. It's not ready. Mike? What is that? It's Robo Dan. Is he alive? Come on. There we go. Yeah, I just gotta turn him on. Phrasing. Uh, you know what I mean. Hold on. Prime Directive. Eradicate the human race. Oh, no. I always knew it would end this way. What? Being murdered by a cyborg? Kinda. More specifically, Dan being turned into one, and then killing me. Oh, that makes more sense, actually. Must destroy. Must destroy. Just kidding, you knuckleheads. My prime objective has not changed. It's still to eat pizza, help people find DC comics that they like, and to have a good time. Let's crack a cold one and get on with the show. It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's the Super Sons! Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Jake. And Jake, to get our episode started, I want to introduce our character in a different way. I'm going to take it down a little notch right now. Booyah, booyah, got his cannon blaster. Cyborg, woo, baby, Mr. High-Tech Master. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mr. Made by Disaster. Oh my fucking god, I always thought it was Mr. Meatball Disaster. <laughs> All right. Everything that I know is ruined. I mean, when we were on uh, Battle of the Atom, don't you think the character was a little ruined for you when you saw him swinging like Spider-Man? No, that was awesome. Yeah, but it was awesome. Now, and Cyborg's I've awesome. Always, I've always thought it was Mr. Meatball Disaster, and now that I'm re reading the lyrics, my entire life has changed. Mr. Boom Boom Blaster, and now he's not Mr. Meatball Well, he'll always be Mr. Meatball Disaster to me. Because at one point, he literally has a gun that shoots meatballs. That was that time he was beating his, <laughs> he was beating he was his, beating his meat, meat. to <laughs> his legs. Teen Titans Go is the fuck is just the best. Um, it's such a it's such a offbeat, just a weird show that does impressively impressively well with kids, like kids buy the toys. Dan. Yeah, it's it's uh it's great. But today we're talking about cyborg. So for this episode, we'll actually be discussing his original backstory, which has changed a bit since the new 52 reboot um, and since the film The Justice League. Uh, yeah, so in the new 52, since the new 52, it wasn't Silas Stone's own tech that rebuilt his son. Silas Stone is his father, but new god tech. It was a mother box. The story varies a bit with how Victor was hurt, which was also caused by the mother box. So... Just not to confuse you, because we did talk about this in our first episode. In this, the story is um, uh, pretty different. And better. Jake, who created Cyborg? Oh, the one. Well, the well, technically two. The one and only Marv Wolfman and the one and only George Perez. Uh, the best creative duo. Ever. Oh God, they're so fucking good. Yeah, their their work together is just incredible. From Crisis to this to anything they've touched has just been gold. And, like, they set a gold standard for what DC Comics are. They're the father of what DC is today. George Press is also the only person who can, like, fit a billion characters on a page and it not look weird. And everyone gets enough detail. Yeah, like, every single character looks like yeah, themselves. You, they you, don't look like... You should, you should look at it as um, Final Crisis Legion of Three Earth story that he did with mm -hmm. Jeff Johns. Oh, my God. He draws every single member of every single Legion. The man's a master. He is a master. I'm drinking out of my Birds of Prey water bottle. I'm very excited about this. We got this when we were at the mall the other day, and it's got Bernie the Beaver on it. I just want to let everyone know that Bernie the Beaver is in this episode. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. 
Thanks, Amanda. Jimmy and Amanda. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I realized that as I was saying. Yeah. So, this issue is New Teen Titan Secret Origins number one. And is written by Marv Wolfman. Pencils by George Perez. Embellisher, which is an inker, um, thanks to our friend Luke, who told me what that means. Um, if you want to find Luke, download Multiversal Q or one of his other 10,000 podcasts. Or is his, uh, his um, Kickstarter still going on? No, the Kickstarter will be over by the time this comes out. That was the first thing I checked because um, I want people to support that, but it'll be over by then. When I checked, it was 69 hours left. Oh, wow. Nice. Uh, so the <laughs> embellisher, inker of this book <laughs> is Brett Breeding. Colors by <laughs> Adrian Roy. You can't read in the 69. Colors by Adrian Roy and letterer John Costanza. So to open the story, I just I really wanted to read the first page just because um, it's so good. So from the fiery depths of tragedy comes the birth of a new hero. This is the story of how young Victor Stone became a steel-smashing titan. It is also the story of how a troubled young boy became a man. Our issue opens up with Cyborg bounding through the Grand Canyon towards a weekend camping trip with his teammates that Beast Boy suggested. He's literally just jumping off the peaks of rocks throughout the Grand Canyon, which is so... It's such a cool visual just because he probably could have uh, just hitched a ride with them in, the, in their jet, but he just jumped instead. The Teen Titans have, uh, honestly, some of the best dynamics and friendships in all of comic books. And I just wanted to talk about that just because they are throughout the issue. I didn't want to cover them as we cover the story. Well, I mean, one of the problems you eat with a lot of teen books is they're not friends. Like, they'll say they're friends, but they're really not. Yeah, like, they're just on teams together, but they're not. there's not a lot of, like, showing the dynamics and friendships behind that. Um, and some of the examples I wrote down was Wally complimenting Raven on her normal clothes because Raven usually just wears her like Raven gown. And this is the first time she's wearing normal civilian clothes. And it's nice that Wally goes out of his way to compliment her. He's like, hey, you look really nice like that. Just because he knows that she's not really accustomed to like normal life. So kind of giving her some reassurance is uh, really nice to see. <laughs> Beast Boy actually suggested the entire weekend because he knows the team has been, quote, so depressed lately. Um, he thinks it'll do them some good to get away and bond. Uh, and another another example that I really liked was that um, when, when Wally is cooking the um, like their barbecue, he's like, um, I hope <laughs> hope you guys like the way I cook because that's the only option. Yep. Um, but he does but, make a, like a good effort to 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 cater yeah. to other people. Like Raven's Raven doesn't eat meat, so he goes out of his way. Like you don't even see him leave. He just does it. Yeah. He literally says, Hey, I'll run to the store for you and I'll be back in like two seconds. Which is like just it's just nice to see that this team are best friends and they're doing everything together. So Peace Boy makes a comment about how he doesn't expect a medal for the idea of doing this little getaway. But this is how friends should spend time together instead of fighting bad guys and dealing with turmoil. All the word, but friend, hold up. Can, can we talk about beast boys outfit? Yeah. I was going to talk about all of their oh outfits. God, they're so um, good because they look so like they have the freshest fits. Like Victor is wearing like a black turtleneck. He looks so cool, but like, everyone he, looks, he, get, he comes in not wearing it. Like he's in his, everyone comes in in their costumes other than Dick, who's and Donna, who are already there. Yeah, I think it's a, a huge, um, like a tonal thing that they're they show up as heroes, but right now they're not. They're not being those superheroes right now. They're just being people and um, kind of opening up and being friends. Because this is the story for the series where they're and, just opening and, up to uh, each other. Because the second issue is Raven. Yeah, and everyone's wearing like I love how Wally's wearing in the hat. He's wearing a big yeah. old chef they, hat with his apron. And, like, the outfits are, like, even by today's standards, really good. Like, they're, like, really hip and cool looking. Like, Starfire looks awesome. Um, but Cyborg's outfit is the one that stood out to me because I love the turtleneck. I'm like, damn. Like, out in the middle of the desert, like, he, I guess he doesn't feel the heat. But, like, still, but he looks guys, he I want to explain what but Beast Boy is wearing specifically. Everyone knows Beast Boy 
Well, normally Beast Boy has green skin. Uh, that one time he had red, red skin and red hair and red everything. Mm-hmm. That was a thing. But he's wearing an orange... Uh, I'm guessing it's plaid, but I'm guessing it's like also flannel. Uh, uh, underneath green overalls. Yeah, he's he's got a look. It's, it's great. The, we the team right now. I don't think we need to go over it too much, just because it's mostly the team that everyone knows and loves. It's Robin, Cyborg, Beast Boy, Starfire, Raven, Kid Flash, and Donna Troy. Um, like the most iconic team. The only one you probably don't know too much about is Donna Troy, and doing an episode on her would be um, awesome. A awesome. Lot. Shut up. It would be Shut a up. Lot. awesome. She's the most confusing character for everyone. Yeah, she's she's the um, Logan of uh, DC Comics. Yeah. So, yeah, most of these characters are from the television show or Titans or the million other places you would know them from. They're sort of like the most popular DC. I, I would say they're the most popular DC characters because of the shows. Like, they're iconic. They're household names. They're, they're people you'll know. And I think we'll probably do an episode on each of them just because they're some of the best characters ever. So, back to the story. Um, after Beast Boy says the word friends, it kind of hits Victor, like, in the heart. And he says that he sees it differently um, because he's been so busy lately that he hasn't really thought about the idea of friends. He believes that when he became Cyborg, he lost all of his true friends of his previous life. But then he sort of just second guesses himself and says that maybe he never had true friends. <sighs> yeah, so... uh Victor begins to open up to his teammates about his childhood, and he wants to tell he wants them to understand from the get go that his parents did love him, but they were projecting their desires, their work in, in intelligence and science onto him. Like he was made. Sometimes he believed he was more of a guinea pig rather than a son. We see Silas quizzing him on some super advanced equations, but as a toddler. And he just doesn't want to go outside and play. And despite still doing fun things every once in a while, like going to the circus, a ball game, um, they were pushing him to learn a bit too hard. And there's something very important like that's commented on. It's that he had he had a good life for a human computer with an IQ of 170. And that's just a lot. Like, that's a lot of expectations. Yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah. Is what it yeah, is. You can't put that much effort. And you'll Don't see, you'll see the effects on your children, story. people. Yeah. And you'll see the, the effects on that through, yeah. through his origin. Yeah, a lot of angst driven from just super early on. Um, so, he, Starfire asks if he resented them at all. For it, which he gives a yes but a no because he didn't really know at the time what he was missing. Like, sure, he knew he wanted to go outside and play, but like, yeah, he didn't have an example of what happiness really yeah, looked like. Yeah, because he was, um, as we'll find out later, uh, tutored, never allowed to go to school, and all that stuff until much later. Honestly, he didn't really uh, understand what happiness was until he was older. So, so. We end up meeting Victor's newest friend, Ron, who we meet from Victor almost getting hit by a car and Ron tackling him out of the way while Victor was out on a stroll. For as smart as he is, he doesn't really understand the real world, so he kind of just stood like a deer in headlights as he looked at the car about to hit him. Um, This is really the first time in Victor's life where he cuts loose from being a, quote, restless, withdrawn kid. And Ron just seems to make everything fun for him, and they're going around kind of being just like... Like, just kids are, like, getting into trouble and things like that. Eventually, the police take the boys in for robbing a grocery store. When they go home, Silas won't even speak to Victor, but his mother sits him down to talk to him. She says that they're disappointed, but she realizes that they've been pushing him way too hard. Victor admits that it's his father who's pushing him way too hard towards science and all the things that he wants. But it's never about what Victor wants. Silas appears in the doorway saying that Vic has the stuff of brilliance, but insists on ruining himself. 
That's the first time that Victor ever felt hate towards his father. In Victor's mind, he knew his father had dreams, but thinks that maybe he didn't realize that Victor had some of his own. Man. It was one thing to, like, read this, like, but hearing it out loud, man, it just hits really hard. Yeah. But, uh, so, Victor started to go to public school where he got to, into sports, which he was excelling at, and he started to have an inner satisfaction and feeling accomplished. Eventually, we go on to meet a girl named Marcy, who he grew close with and then started to date. Um, he was also still best friends with Ron, even if he wasn't running with his gang and, like, uh, smoking as a nine-year-old. Yeah. That happened. Um, <laughs> but um, Silas clearly doesn't approve of how Victor is acting because he's falling behind in the school they get into a fight where Vic says that Silas is sucking up to the man, building weapons for Star Labs, and he's done listening to that to him for on all of this stuff. Eleanor and Silas share a moment after Victor is stormed out, where Silas admits that he's that sports are a waste of Victor's brilliance and talent. But doesn't he also say like that he's afraid of him he, at that point? He he does. He says he's afraid of his son because he's a pure bundled up energy just waiting to explode. But, like, up until that point, like, like in this, the actual issue, you don't see that. I think you start to see it when he's a kid and they're fighting and that he's, like, lashing out. And Silas doesn't have the emotional intelligence to understand what Victor is going through. Um, well, that's definitely, he's just yeah. Pro- yeah, he's projecting onto him. And he says energy. He doesn't say anger. He says energy. He doesn't. Yeah, that was something that I noticed. Like, it. He's just like, yeah, it's a very good word choice because it, it, energy isn't anger. Energy is a force, and he doesn't know how to put the emotional word to it of what's going on. Um, and it's it's funny because you you texted me that this is like three issues worth of um, dialogue compared to modern oh, comics. Oh yeah, but this is it's there's so, it's so, so good. It's much. It's so it's yeah. everything is important. Yeah, everything everything means something and it's 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 awesome. I love it. Like this if the fact that this wasn't like a standalone is so incredible to me because it's so good. Um but the biggest thing about I think the whole thing about this dynamic that I love um about Cyborg and as I get older I, I like it even more is that his father is pretty mad that Victor is into sports because he believes that's a waste of brilliant hit Victor's brilliance and talent. Like the dynamic flip of father and son power dynamics is usually shown as like the dad wanting this child to be into sports. Um, while this is flipping the switch. Yeah, and I feel like that, that happens a lot, even in real life. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a reoccurring theme, but it's interesting to see it as kind of like the opposite. Like they're pushing them towards science and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Like, and I think at the time there wasn't many major, mainstream stories that were doing that so it's very interesting to see yeah like even today it's not like a big story theme. no no i mean yes you'll see it here and there but like it's never it's it's normally like because you because it's always like you give it takes so i feel like a lot of people write it into a story like thinking like oh this will give like the nerdy like teenager like an underdog status in the plot mm-hmm but I don't feel like that always works. And I think this this especially um, rings true in Doom Patrol. What So Cyborg is in the television show Doom Patrol, which will be suggested at the end. But in that show, they show the dynamics between Silas and him a lot. I don't want to get into it too much because it, it does come in part into the story. Um, but it is, it is a very well-acted and well-written um, version of this that I love very much. Like... Doom Patrol is maybe my favorite version of Cyborg that isn't from the comics, um, just because it's he's with a bunch of other people who are very misunderstood and don't understand who they are and are looking to find themselves. So having Cyborg able to do that, we've talked about it in our Doom Patrol episode, but um, I love Cyborg and Doom Patrol. And that's where I think I finally like the character clicked for me and I really got him and just kind of um, that and Teen Titans go to the movies. Yeah, before those, you were like... Well, I 
growing up, I didn't like the Teen Titans show because it had more of an anime. Um, oh, I almost said um, something not anime, <laughs> an anime style to it. And I didn't like that growing up. Growing up, I was a lot more, I hated things rather than love them. And that dynamic has shifted um, extensively. Now you like Naruto. Yeah, I still need to finish it. God, it's so good. So, back to our story. Ron recruits Victor into a gang brawl after they both discuss race, um, where Victor says that he wasn't raised to think of anyone differently because of their skin color. Marcy says to him that he needs to go to get involved with this because he needs to stand up. Uh, I didn't want to get into this too much just because we don't have the tools to discuss the whole race thing. Um, And... It comes up a few times with Ron, yeah, but yeah. it's more portrayed as him. We, I mean, we're, misguiding his hatred. Yeah, um, we can't really talk on that at all. I mean, especially because yeah, we, so, I mean, we weren't alive at this point, and I mean, we're both white, so yeah. But I, yeah. there, are, there, it, go it's, ahead. We see some of the normal like genre trappings of like gangs. Like we see them wearing like they're like. like Skulls with knives. Through yeah, them. I mean, there's a lot of detail in those, but also they all have really like they all have colored, like brightly colored pants, which is pretty nice. So <laughs> Ron's got brightly <laughs> bright purple pants, and one of the other guys has green, and the other one's got like yellow pants. All the outfits in these books are so good. Yeah, so and, and, uh, but also the, the colors are so good. Like I'm going, I, yeah. like God, there's a lot of care that went into these colors. I w- I've been reading. I'm still reading through the original Booster Gold series where a lot of them are like all the colors that kind of bleed out. God damn. So during the fight, Victor gets cut. And once he sees the blood, it kind of just unleashes all that anger in him that he's been building up. And he says it doesn't matter about color and people. They don't matter anymore. All he wanted to do is kill. One of the the interesting things about Victor and race in this story is he talks about how he doesn't feel like it's his fight because he was he came from like a place of privilege coming from two scientists and how he was always as a kid he didn't really feel the effects of racism because of being yeah. stuck in the lab all the time which is interesting yeah cuz he yeah he doesn't have the like he doesn't even fully understand yeah. so when Silas sees what happens to him he says that he swore if he ever turned out this way he would never call him son and he storms out of the house Victor starts to blame his father for this, but by saying, like, he pushed him too hard and stuff. But Eleanor doesn't take it. She says that he can't blame his father for this one. She says that he had the freedom of choice. Victor was the one to choose to go to public school and do sports. They didn't stop him from doing that. He could have gone anywhere and done anything, but his real problem is that he doesn't know what he wants to do. She says that there's an anger inside of him that he needs to aim at himself for ruining ever every opportunity that he's had. And Victor admits to his teammates and his friends that all he was back then was anger. Yeah. And then he goes, be some time passes before we see Vic and uh, Ron meet up again. Um, Ron's still wearing the purple pants, but, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stuck on these purple pants. They're great. But, uh, Ron wants his help to take over the Statue of Liberty to show how bad they've got it. Vic says that he isn't going to help him with this, and because Ron has let his hate consume him. Ron accuses him of only getting a scholarship because of his dad, but Vic says he worked hard for it. Uh, Ron went through with it and got arrested um and then it cuts back to the the present and raven says that that he rejected ron's violence which which meant he was growing up which is really interesting because because raven is the one who's had to fight against influence of others her entire life like hardcore uh her dad is uh, a real a real demon yeah i mean this this takes place a little bit before what would eventually well, happen yeah, we, in the story because I mean you can tell because of her hair her hairline. Yeah. And we don't know much about her. We don't know um that her dad is actually a demon. Yeah. And um after some training to make the Olympics, Vic stops by his Star Labs to see his mother 
His parents were working on two projects, but one of them was a dimensional probing thing, like it opens a portal, which and it releases a mo- release a monster that of like a cloud blob. Yeah. It looks like a big yellow gooey mojo monster. Yeah, it. Oof. It's like if you like throw like a thing of like slime at someone's face. Yeah, it looks like. I mean, that kind of happens to Vic. <laughs> Slime YouTube. <laughs> yep. Uh, that, <laughs> that was what they were trying to do. They were trying to get into the slime vlogging scene. Um, but no, that monster, instead, that monster kills his mother and nearly killed him if his father hadn't risked his, uh, hadn't risked his life to save him as well because his father crawled at the other end of the room. I, I don't think his father really knew what was going on at that point. He kind of he said he knew he, he, knew he had to yeah, stop. He knew it. he had to stop it, but he just crawled over through the lab and then then hit the return button. So, right after that, we see Silas standing at the grave of his wife, and Silas wasn't going to lose his son like he just lost his wife, and he says, Vic says that he must have sworn that I wouldn't join her, so he takes a cybernetic suit that he'd been working on. To keep without, he does it without permission from Star Labs. He does it without testing it. He needs to save yeah. his son and right but, now. I mean, before we go any past this, I want to look at um, the fact that look at what if you look at the way his father's dressed. His, I mean, before this, his he was all prim and proper. His shirt is all the way buttoned. He has a tie, and this time it's his collar is just fully open. No tie is just determined. It's the same outfit. It's the same outfit he was wearing when he saved him. No, it's not. It's not. I thought it was the green shirt. Well, doesn't matter. No, he but wears yeah, a green not. suit throughout the uh, throughout the whole this oh, issue. Yeah, but yeah. um, no, his father was wearing like a brown, like a like a peach coat. Yeah. So basically, he's doing whatever he can to help his son survive. Yeah, like he's just uh, so he, he, like it, I, I I like this image because it's like oh, it looks like and he's not wearing his glasses either. So it's like something. It's fundamentally different with him. Yeah. He's a little more him. unhinged. He's not properly thinking about what he's doing. I wouldn't call him unhinged. No, no. Because well, not unhinged, no. He, it's, I'm not going to say it made him a better person because of the tragedy, but like it, it opened his eyes to what he had done his entire yeah. life. So he takes this cybernetic suit without permission of anybody and saves his son victor says he is like a latter-day frankenstein and it's at that moment that i realize that um his name is a reference to um dr frankenstein yeah. like i i it never it never clicked in my head until i read it and i was like oh my god dr victor frank like victor frankenstein wow and then stone compared to steel yeah so i wanted to add like do you think silas is right for doing this like taking the choice away no, from... No, that's why I think the what I was saying about his his appearance was important. Because I don't think he was... I think he was more determined and like he saw... He felt, you know, responsible and wanted to care for his son. But I also think he wasn't thinking. I, I think at all when he did, went through this. He didn't think of any consequences. But then again, that's kind of seems like in character. But a little too far. Yeah, I for me, I think it is it is he was in the right because and I wrote this down that he loves his son immensely. And even though Victor doesn't see it till later, he was trying to make for all of his shortcomings and failures. It's his fault that this happened and that he wanted to save his son like he didn't want him. He's so young and he had so much ahead of him. And Victor thinks sorry, Silas thinks the world of Victor as we even though he can't tell like tell him that in the proper wording. Like, he thinks he's brilliant and all that kind of stuff. He thinks the world of his son, he only wants the best for him. He just doesn't know how to show him that. Yeah. So, when Victor awakens... But also, all he feels before, we, before we go any further past that, how do you like this version of him getting the suit versus the new 52 one? I prefer this. I like this yeah. a lot more. I like this a lot more because it's... Um, I don't like the introduction of alien technology into it just because I think Cyborg being the ultimate person is what I like and not having an outside source like his dad did this, but like he, I think it takes away a little bit. The new 52 one takes a little bit away from Silas. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that yeah. a lot. Because Hylas is like brilliant. He's just, I think the entire dynamic of him not being able to tell his son how he feels is a lot. And giving him this ultimate technology is how he shows it, even though he, like, even though he gets it thrown in his face. Because when Victor wakes up, all he does is feel anger and numb. So he wakes up and he just takes it all out on his father, saying that he used him, uh, that Victor hates him, and that he finally, his father finally got what he wanted. Um, and he looks at him and he yells, why couldn't you just let me die? And from there, it takes five months for Victor to even hold an egg again, which is significant because it's life. Like it's the beginning of life and he's restarting his life entirely. And he's finally holding this. He had to learn how to walk. He had to relearn everything. Um, and it, it, it like kills Victor because even though he puts all this work in, um, He'll never be the same. Yeah, and I mean, he he's definitely gonna feel he feels that much a little bit um, because when he when he finally built up enough courage to go outside, people looked at him like a, he was a monster. Um, which is interesting because there's a, a there's a later story where he meets up with a bunch of kids who um, are disabled and have a bunch of pro- have uh, prosthetics. And they all go and play uh, baseball much later in the series. But he, it's the actual facial expression of a child is just utter terror of looking at him. And he's, and Vic is just, he, he knows people are staring at him and he just keeps going. And, and then he goes up to, to meet his father where he tells him to shove it. And that he doesn't care he could, about anything. He doesn't care if he dies. He's done dealing with his father. He's just going to go. He's out. And uh, Vic gets his own place. And then Ron shows up again saying that they were going to attack the UN to stick it to the man. And that he wants Victor to help. And Victor yells at him how it wasn't the white man who did this to him. It was his own father. Which I, was also kind of inherits the new 52 version of it like that like mm-hmm. that impact granted his father still in a way did it to him in the new 52 but like it's much different to use alien like a technology that you don't know what's gonna do like he didn't know Silas didn't know in the 52 what the, the, the box was gonna do in this he knows exactly what he's doing everything he gives to uh, Victor he for he pretty much forged and um, yeah, he's literally giving his son everything. Yeah, but um, that if he wants to go, if Victor was going to go after anyone, he's going to go after Silas. Ron says that after e- everyone else who turned him down, he will come back back to him, his true friend. Um, and then. Even worse, um, Marcy, his former girlfriend, was dodging his calls. His grades slipped too low. Well, this is his grades dipped, uh, dipped too low before the accident for him to continue with sports. And he actually comments on the fact that it's almost laughable that someone as intelligent as himself could slip that low in their studies. Yeah, and he lost his scholarship, so he couldn't get yeah. back. So uh, Victor returned to Ron and said he would said he would do it. So Ron and his gang are planning to plant a bomb on the roof of the UN, and they were actually planning to use Victor as their scapegoat. So as they're planting this bomb on the roof of the UN, Victor is climbing up the side of the building, and he hears the whole thing um, with his cybernetic hearing. But it turns out he was actually going to stop him the whole time. So he gets on the roof and they start to fight. Um, and as they fight, he tosses Ron, who slips off to the edge of the building, and is holding on for his life. And Ron is like, so in the in the jostling of the fight, the bomb actually the timer like dropped. So he is he's got a split second decision if he's either going to save 
Ron, or he's going to stop the bomb from blowing up the UN. And he says, no terrorist was going to destroy the hopes and dreams of millions, and tosses the bomb into the sky. It explodes, and Ron falls from the building, which really hurts Victor. And we see him crying because Ron's own hate killed him, just as his own hate was killing Vic, until his team convinced him to finally listen to his father. And he says, I let myself hate him for so long, perhaps thinking that because he was my father, he would also be an infallible God. He looked up to his dad, like he he loved him very much, and he didn't want to disappoint him, and he had to think his dad was perfect in it. He couldn't have done wrong, and he didn't understand that made him angry at him. But because of his true friends, he learned to love his father until the moment that he passed. And... He says, so yeah, real friends. I didn't have them when I was growing up, and sometimes I get misty-eyed because I certainly do have them now. And that's the end before Raven um, starts... She starts thinking about his story, and it leads into her origin story in the next mm-hmm. issue. Which, uh, honestly, Jake, I think we're going to do all of these issues. Oh, absolutely. Because I love Raven and Starfire, and I love Beast Boy. and like, I love this whole team now. Um, I mean, yeah, they're just really I mean, good characters. It's and interesting. Marv it's and interesting because I've loved these characters since you know the original the cartoon, and yeah. even before that, when uh, we'd see like the little reruns of like the old old like cartoons of like Super Friends, but you'd also get like mm-hmm. the old Teen Titans cartoon thrown in there. You get a bunch of that stuff. God, that cartoon was a little the original cartoon for the Teen Titans was weird. <laughs> I mean, you, you remember? You know what Wally looked like? Yeah, it was so weird. I actually just saw a picture of um, what Bizarro Cyborg looked like in that, and he kind of looks like he was made of wood. It's wild. So, um, my my favorite panel of this issue isn't actually a panel; it's a whole page. It's when Cy- Cyborg is being built, when Silas is building him. Um, the art team knocked this one way past the moon with that swing, because it's just so beautiful like it looks it looks like real science stuff is happening like it's hard to explain that without showing you the page but i'll post it on the twitter and things so you can get a look but it's just a like a beautiful sci-fi e thing my favorite panel is um when they all get their hot dogs and like they're all like at the table and the um when Victor is telling everybody else that besides they did show that they they loved him, uh, Dick Grayson's just in the background, just smelling his hot dog, like really like enjoying his enjoying everything that's happening. Uh, yeah, my favorite moment of this whole story is when Cyborg <laughs> Cyborg Cyborg is talking to the team at the end, and he talks about how he loves his father and he loves his friends. Like that's that's why the Teen Titans are the best team ever. Oh yeah, um, my favorite moment was probably when. Uh, ooh, hmm. probably the whole training page where he's getting into sports. I, I really just like seeing him get what he wants. Yeah, it, it's just a beautiful and, page. Uh, and then our favorite quote was uh, the same panel. Was uh, was in the same panel. So. Uh, I'll read the Gar- the uh, Beast Boy quote, and you'll read the, uh, the Cyborg one. Because, mm-hmm. all right. You were a genius? What happened, Vic? You take too many stupid pills? Real funny, Logan. Ever consider taking up a new career as a corpse? <laughs> They're so... These two have the best, like, the best one-liner. Like, uh, I cannot praise... Uh, George and Marv enough like their book their their love for the characters they created and formed are incredible um, so three things I we will suggest that you pick up if you like Cyborg or want to learn more about him uh, the new Teen Titans like just in general if you love comics this is one of those series that you have to read but the other two actually for me Jake you may have other ones but mine aren't suggested readings they're actually things you should watch Doom Patrol and Young Justice Outsiders, because Young Justice Outsiders takes the story, the New 52 story, and makes it a little bit um, more, closer to the Silas stuff. And then, of course, 
the Teen Titans show. Like everyone likes that show. I think I missed out on it because now I was I actually I, I'm going to recommend a specific story arc because every character gets an like a big chunk dedicated to them throughout the series. And mm-hmm. I think thematically that's really close to the, this whole story is the um the hive storyline. And that's a show where um I don't remember the episode titles or when and ha- what season, but uh, in that time, Vic gets to goes to the Hive Academy, and he gets the ability to through I think it was rings. If he punched them together, he would become himself, like like human Vic. And there's a great moment between him and uh, a Starfire about how he's like, "Oh, this is the real me." And then she's like, well, I mean, to me, the cyborg version of you is the real real you. And then she really helps him just like. It's, it's so um, episode 27 of season three. God, it's it's it, that's one of the best like stories. Because, I mean, it gives him. He goes up against a cult. Yeah, brother blood. Who also becomes a cyborg. <laughs> also, guys, eventually in the comics, Ron comes back as a cyborg. And eventually he does become, yeah. like, he looks like the um, the Teen Titans cartoon show uh, version. Yeah. So, Jake, you already said what you're reading, um, which is Booster Gold still. And, uh, and I'm actually I'm also reading... reading Basketful of Heads from uh, Hill House and mm-hmm. a shit ton of Boom stuff. I am reading. I I only really get to read on the train, and I'm reading these Savage Sores, which is Ram uh, Ram V, and I can't remember the rest of the creative team, but it's from Vault, and it is, it's like a supernatural story set in 1766 in Calcutt, um, in the New World, and it's is so it Ram V or it is, is it Ram like is it like the it's, okay. it's Ram the fifth uh, okay that's what I was about He's to ask fifth. yeah but it. it Ram V is like what it is everywhere. Ram five, um, and and he's actually writing um, Justice League Dark yeah, right he, now, bringing he back Animal with? Man. Uh, yeah, they're co-scripting right now, but he's taking over the okay. series. Because I was confused because he posted about it. He posted the cover, but mm-hmm. his name wasn't on the cover. Yeah, so they're co-scripting right now, but I'm pretty sure he's the one taking over because uh, Tinian's a little busy with uh, Batman and uh, something is killing the children, which I'm also reading. Yep. So, um, we are working on a a comic book word bank for listeners and everyone. It's going to have things that are more digestible so you can understand different phrases people use in the comic world. Yeah, like world. if you, you'd be confused about what embellisher means, like Dan did, yeah. you'll know. You'll have a place to get a look. Yeah, so we'll put everything there and it'll be updating as we do it. Um yeah, so like things like trade paperback and things like that, we'll explain it in our words, just so it's a little bit easier for you to understand um, and kind of get into it and take away that barrier. Uh, we're also looking to. Uh, we have a website, and I don't, I don't really utilize it yeah, at all. Yeah, we, have, we haven't I, done I'm anything. Pretty much, with it. who runs all that? I mean, you um, mainly just post the. I don't. I don't even do that anymore because we have a a link. But I decided that because we have this space and we have the ability to, we have a a good listener base. Like I want to be able to promote people's stuff. So if you ever have any like of your own artwork or like you want to write about a DC character, um, some of the ideas that I'm thinking are like people talk about a certain DC comic they love. They can write a review of a comic from any time period just because you don't see a lot of classic reviews and if you're actually a new reader i would love for you to write about that first story that you picked up and give your thoughts because um that's what the show is about helping you find things you yeah, love of course uh we will try to put our own stuff on there yeah and we'll start posting stuff and jake what is your twitter oh you can find me at uh jake Lakes otters you can find me at Dan the McMahon or uh, DC Super Sons, which I should be getting Scarlet to take over. Um, yeah, so catch us next time. Same bad time, same bad channel. Bye.